Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar on education, the passport to the future, supporting our clinicians from graduation to advanced practice. We'll just wait a few moments for everybody to join us. Everyone will be placed on mute as they join. We do really encourage you to use the Q&A function for questions and we'll definitely try and do our hardest to get to all those questions at the end. Just to remind everybody, today's webinar has been recorded and will be made available. I think we're just about ready to start, encouraging you all to use the Q&A function. I'm going to hand over to Amanda, our chair for today. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to everybody. My name is Amanda Hensman Crook. For you, those of you who don't know me, I'm a consultant MSK physiotherapist working in primary care. And my other hat is Health Education England's Allied Health Professions National Clinical Fellow. And I'm going to be doing the chairing for today. So this is the eighth webinar in the Connect Health Change series. Webinars which aim to make and embed transformation in healthcare. So far, the topics that have been covered are IAPT, quality improvement, artificial intelligence, first contact practitioners, chronic pain and COVID rehab, which can all be found on the Connect Health Change webpage if you're interested in going back and having a look at those afterwards. Today, we're going to be focusing on education about how we can support our clinicians from graduation to advanced practice. Each presenter will speak for seven minutes, followed by immediate questions but we'll take the majority of the questions at the end. So please don't forget to post your um, your, your questions in the Q&A box. So it's the Q&A box, the one with the little question mark on, not the one that's just the square one with lines on. We have a really impressive lineup of speakers today. Um, you can find all their full biographies on the web page. Um, so, um, so please feel free to have a look at those. So, as you know, the roadmap to FCP and ACP is um, well landed now for, for MSK and there's many clinicians that are already on their way to developing their portfolios and many that are moving into the, on the teaching side of it into the master's module for FCP. Um, it's got a really clear structure uh, of governance and education development with supervision that's very clear boundaries around that uh, for the portfolio route as well. But how do advanced practitioners develop the high standards of skills required for primary care? And why is this important? And why have we put a standard of practice in? Up until now, we've really relied on job descriptions and pay bandings, which of course doesn't prove a capability of a clinician. And it also doesn't really support a clinician developing in terms of their career pathway and their educational development. So this webinar is going to discuss how the roadmap actually translates into practice. How do we do this? What's the importance of having supported education programmes and how are level seven education going to be achieved? both via the HEIs and by the portfolio route. Two different routes with the same, same amount of um, capability. It's exactly the same thing that underpins it all, but how does that actually happen in practice and how can we support you to do that? So this webinar is going to cover how to turn policy into practice, effective training models and opportunities to develop clinical practice, the importance of advanced clinical practice from graduation to development in any speciality and in any healthcare sector from primary care, secondary or community care to reach level seven master's level advanced clinical practice status. We're going to be looking at the four pillars, the clinical pillar, research, leadership and education. Now, I am hoping that we can introduce Neil first but he's been having some connection problems. So I will introduce him, but it may be that we need to go on to the second um, person if, um, if Neil's not able to connect with us. So hopefully we've got Neil Langridge. I'd like to introduce him. He's an NHS consultant physiotherapist from Southern Health Trust. He's a visiting fellow at University of Winchester, president of the APPN, 
and he's the education lead at the MACP and he's going to be discussing the need for education to be able to support the implementation of the roadmap for advanced clinical practice in MSK physiotherapy. Um, so Neil is current, um, hopefully he's, um, I think he might be on mute at the moment, but he's also, please bear with him, he's not been able to connect to the live web page, so he's on his phone. So just expect that he, there will be a delay between Neil speaking and the slides coming up. So we apologise for that, but unfortunately his trust network doesn't support this, put this live platform. So Neil, are you there? OK, so it might be that he's not there. I'm just, um, I should just text. With the best will in the world, it doesn't matter how many times we do these things. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the virtual world doesn't always be best kind to us all. So Neil, are you with us? Off mute or should we move on? Oh, um, can we unmute Neil, please, Ali? I suggest we move to the next speaker, Amanda. Sorry about this. Amanda, you may be on mute now. It's a good, good game this, isn't it? So we're moving on to Ashley James, um, National Clinical Education Need for Connect Health, who will introduce the Academy and effective, uh, and effective and practical implementation of portfolio education on a large scale. Thank you, Ash. No problem. Hopefully people can see me and hear me. There we are. Hello everyone. Mine is working. We can we can move on. Uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, and as Amanda mentioned there, I'm going to be talking and introducing our academy. Uh, so we just want to go on to the first slide for me or the next slide there. Um, so we introduced our academy at the start of this year and its implementation uh, our route to implementation I, I, I'm going to talk through today and, and just the practical steps we took along the way and how that ties in with the roadmap that Amanda um, laid out there and, and mentioned and how it ties into all of our other clinicians as well. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today and how we've how we've gone about doing that. So next slide, please. So here we have I'm going to briefly talk through each one of these these stages. Um, so stage one there, understanding what our staff needed to know, agreeing the commitment of time for our clinicians, map a multidisciplinary curriculum, identifying uh, our faculty, design and implementate implementation of, of our digital platforms, um, what our staff needed to learn and how they could plan their learning and then how we implemented that via communication. So seven steps there that I'm going to briefly talk about and hopefully it'll give you an idea of how we will manage to scale up that implementation. So next slide, please. The first thing that we needed to understand, which Health Education England, Amanda and Neil and the team had, had for FCP and AP have, have quite beautifully done for us in terms of laying out the roadmap, but we needed to understand what our staff needed to know. So as I mentioned, the roadmap does that for us. It lays out a curriculum, um, it lays out competencies, um, so that gives clinicians insight into what they need to know. But we also needed to do this for all of our other staff as well. And there's an example on the screen there of some of the sessions. And we'll talk about the curriculum in, in a minute. But each session that we have put on for our clinicians, uh, we've mapped across any major um, MSK rheumatology pain competency frameworks that are out there, as well as our own internal competency framework. So. All of, our, um, all of our sessions are either mapped to the IFONT standards, uh, MSK core capabilities framework directly, the roadmap or the multi-professional framework for advanced clinical practice. So we've tried to make our curriculum have that direction and direct link to competency framework. So it allows our staff to understand that every session they're doing is meaningful in directing their development. Next slide, please. So once we'd worked out what our staff needed to know by doing that competency mapping exercise, we, we were then in a position where we knew what they needed to know, but before we could implement 
any of our curriculum or thought about implementing our curriculum, we needed to know how much time our staff had um, to be able to commit to education. And at Connect Connect are absolutely brilliant at investing in their staff. And, and the, what we've got to is that for new graduates in our MSK service, 10% of their working time is set aside for onward professional development and 5% thereafter for all other clinical staff is set aside for onward clinical and professional development. Now there's a different culture change in that and, and if any of you on the call have done the uh, Health Education England Supervisors course for example, we talk about learning not just being about the taught sessions but it's about the doing as well. So within that 5 and 10% we include lots of things that might contribute towards someone's development. It's not just looking at their, um, it's not just looking at the taught sessions and, and that, that knowledge, it's also looking at the translation of those skills into cl clinical practice. So taught sessions are included, supervision, audit research, teaching, peer learning, all of those things that will eventually help contribute towards the uh, delivery against the four pillars of practice and it allows people to have that opportunity to build evidence against all of those pillars of advanced practice. So we had what they needed to know, we had the time. Next slide please. So then we needed to, uh, to, to decide what they needed to learn and this is where we got to. So I know this is probably quite small for a lot of you, so the, you know the slides will be available so don't worry about um, squinting too much, please don't hurt your eyes. Um, but where we got to was 11 curriculum streams. So we have 11 curriculum streams that start from our graduate development program at level six, where clinicians enter the business right the way through to advanced practice, uh, our clinical maze advanced level seven series there. Now, along the way, you can see there that the two highlighted boxes there are the advanced practice and the FCP. So we have specific streams that are dedicated, particularly the FCP stream, is dedicated and mapped against the roadmap. So it allows clinicians on that stream to start to build a portfolio for stage one. Now, just doing that stream is not going to be enough in itself to get you signed off for stage one, but it provides a really good basis and a springboard for you to be able to generate and um, build that stage one portfolio before you go on to develop stage two once you are in primary care. Again, for adva the advanced practice stream, that comes along with a three month clinical placement with our uh, existing advanced practitioners. Um, and it also has taught sessions uh, against the other four pillars of practice. And the idea being that all of the preceding levels being mapped to the iPhone framework in the future will allow you to build that portfolio much more easily over time. So our G current GDPs and graduates, by the time they get to year three, they'll have lots of evidence uh, that can go into their portfolio that demonstrates their knowledge and skills against the stage one of the roadmap and potentially for other areas of advanced practice for the future as well. We also have uh, levels nine and ten there are streams nine and ten are operational and leadership streams and they contribute towards our operational leaders as well as our clinical leaders. Next slide please. So to implement these 11 curriculum streams. We needed an internal faculty that would allow us to do that. Uh, and I'm really proud of our 70 staff members who are part of our academy faculty, um, multi-professional in nature. So we have uh, GPs, doctors, uh, psychologists, rheumatologists, as well as physiotherapists who all are part of that multi-professional faculty that help deliver education across all of those streams for our clinical and operational staff. Next slide, please. I have not looked at time, so I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at keeping to time, so I'm just going to keep going till Amanda tells me to stop. One minute, Ash. I've written One, the little box. One minute to go. OK, time to motor. Um, so the next stage was a digital platform, so we didn't just want the taught sessions to be the end of what people did um, because that's not a good way to learn. So if you attend a taught session, it's likely that you're not going to retain much of that information unless you go back to it, revisit it, try and embed it into practice. So we've developed an academy website and we utilize Google Classrooms to allow us to store resources, build in MCQs and quizzes um, and allow people to answer and ask questions so we can extend that, that knowledge and learning. Next slide, please. 
We then implemented a bespoke planner for each level of our clinicians, uh, for each of our clinicians in various streams so that they could effectively plan their learning for the year. They all have options about what they can choose. So it's about them doing a learning needs analysis based on that competency framework and identifying areas that will help them improve. So we have a, a, an online planner that can help them do that. And it goes through an approval process with workforce planning their line manager to be able to make sure that that is embedded within their diary and it calculates how much of their 5% or 10% that they've used. Next slide, please. Last slide, and I'm probably going a little bit over, but I'm nearly there, Amanda, I promise. Um, so what did we learn? The first thing we learned was to engage with staff early, particularly in COVID times, lots of change going on. Uh, and this concept of including the doing bit as well as the taught session bit as part of your development is, is potentially something new uh, and something that needs to be introduced carefully. Um, digital solutions don't always have to be expensive. Google Classrooms is free, for example, that we utilize, and it's a brilliant platform for extending that learning. Um, and when you're trying to deliver something at scale, as I know Amanda and Neil and Co will, will uh, definitely understand, is that any small mistakes uh, at a local level can soon turn into large mistakes at scale. So making sure you get the devil in the detail right at the, the first stage is really important. And again, more relevant in COVID times now, but understanding digital literacy of the workforce and anything that you implement digitally, making sure that people have the knowledge and skills to be able to do that is, is something that we want to continually improve moving forward to help our staff engage with our academy. That's it, I think. I'm probably a couple of minutes over. I'm sorry. Well done, Ash. That was great. Thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. So um, I have a question for you. So in terms of education in practice, where do you see the next steps oh, that's um, happening to support career development? Uh, can you say that question again? Sorry, I lost you for a second then. OK, so, so Neil, Neil's not here. OK, okay. And it may be that he can't get on. So just just out of curiosity, yeah. What your opinion is in terms of education and practice, where do you see the next steps happening to support career development? Yeah, I think as I briefly mentioned at the end there, I think it's about that translation of knowledge and skills that may be traditionally acquired in weekend courses or taught courses and how that translate in translates into clinical practice. So that, that transition from stage one to stage two of, of, of the FCP roadmap, for example, that stage two being so important to make sure that we're translating any anything that we learn um, knowledge wise translates into clinical practice. And I think that's where we should concentrate our efforts over the next few years, um, which is why the roadmap provides uh, those different stages so well, I think. That's great. Thank you. It's nice to have that expanded on. And another question um, that we have here is what is the main thing that you think this approach offers and um, that's different to how it was before? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's the structure. So I, I think it's having that curriculum, uh, not just for the roadmap, but across all of our education streams. It gives people direction. There's so much information out there at the moment that if you're just a clinician in the wilderness, there's so many different tangents that you could go off on in terms of learning education. So many courses, so much uh, learning material on the Internet that having that direction that's based on a competency framework allows that guidance much more carefully. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ash, for your time. And of course, you're having a chance to put some um, questions in the chat box so we can pick them up later to ask more questions for him at the end of the session. Thank you very much. We're now going to move over to Dr. Giles Hazan, who is a, a GP with extended role MSK Medicine in Sussex Partnership Foundation Pro, uh, Trust. He's the Barzem Education Committee member. He's RCGP represent He's a representative of the RCG PMSK and versus arthritis core skills trainer. So he's very well versed in MSK. Um, he's going to be discussing the central role of developing the GP standards and GPs with extended roles, education and accreditation. So thank you very much, Giles. Over to you. Thanks very much, Amanda, and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, be part of this uh, fascinating venture. And what an exciting time it is to be involved in musculoskeletal training and education. Um, I really want to just spend a few minutes to touch on where we are with 
GPs with extended role, training, education, and some of the plans for the future, which I've been, um, I've had the privilege of being involved with. Um, so, so just to give you a very brief bit of insight into where I'm coming from, um, I work as a GP primarily in Haywards Heath. I'm based down in the southeast, and I also work in the local pain clinic. Um, and have history of working in an AP role, funny enough, in a spinal clinic. But this this journey that I've taken is very similar to, I think, a number of people. So I've worked very closely with a range of different colleagues um, in physiotherapy and medical specialities. And what we've all shared is this often quite tangential routes, lots of different paths that we've taken um, to, to end up working as uh, advanced practitioners in MSK. So after whatever it was, six years undergrad training, six years postgrad training, uh, and, and then another sort of six or so years working as a GP partner, I decided after all of that, now I'd, I'd like to become a gypsy. Um, and, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, you can imagine my mother was delighted when I told her that I've decided to leave my GP partnership and become a gypsy. Um, and, and it's probably worth spending a bit of time identifying what we mean by that. Well, you know, the gypsy role is one that came out of a number of different roles that existed previously, staff grade roles in hospital. And essentially, it's GPs often who might have worked um, in a previous uh, speciality and then moved across to being a GP. Um, and over time, various different people have got involved in a whole range of different specialities. And in some ways, my, my, my slightly bizarre roots into it, so starting off wanting to be a psychiatrist, I did a psychology degree, then uh, started working clinically, decided actually, no, I'd like to be an orthopedic surgeon, did a little bit of surgical training before then deciding, no, I'd like to be a GP, got involved in education, did some education training, um, and then also got involved in MSK commissioning. And of course, the irony is that all of that has that happy accident was what informed my role and led then when I've been working in MSK, all of that stuff has come together. And that's really what we're talking about in advanced practice and, and these extended roles is that it's a cluster of different skills and skill sets that lead us to work in these settings. Um, and over time that's evolved. And then more recently, if we go to the next slide, please, the Royal College of GPs has recognised that this, this role has evolved and actually has gone now beyond the point where it could be identified as just a standard core GP role. So they brought out a framework in 2018, which is essentially supporting the governance and it's setting the standards around GPs working in extended roles. And the terminology, although it may seem a minor thing, is quite important because this has gone from being a, a role where it's a, an interest to actually being a formally recognised extended role. And most importantly, this is not something that can be done without having further training. Um, and it's not something that is encapsulated within core GP training. So with that comes the need for the same sets of competencies and accreditation that Neil and Amanda have been working on and has now become quite established as the pathways to practice. So there's been this alignment of, of, of progress and need. And this is something we've needed for a long time. So in my time working in, in the GP role and training role, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. I've been really interested in what the experience of, of fellow gypsies have been and now GP with extended role. And I ran a, a survey going back a few years now um, to see what the kind of the qualifications were, what the interests were and what what in old GP language we talk about puns and dens. So patients unmet needs and doctors educational needs. And there was a real hankering for further support and in particular peer support, access to research, latest guidelines, meetings. So there is a real thirst for professional development and continuing professional development, as well as the recognition around that role. So if we go to the next slide, please. So what I've been working on is part of a wider collaboration with a range of uh, groups that represent the non-surgical, non-interventional uh, uh, specialities dealing with uh, MSK medicine. So, so the, the collaboration that we're working in at the moment is 
uh, hosted, if you like, by the, the Faculty of Sports and Exercise Medicine. Uh, and they've opened up a course to accreditation and a diplomat membership of the faculty, which is evolving currently, really recognising the need for accreditation, um, that is going to be a national standardised accreditation, meeting a set of competencies, as well as potentially then creating a home for those of us working in an extended role. That's expanded. So we've now got the, the British Association of Sports and Exercise Medicine, who I sit on the education panel of, as well as the Primary Care Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Medicine Society. So some key players in the kind of medical MSK uh, community all coming together and collaborating on developing things like an applied knowledge test, which would be an entry level test um, of knowledge, which can sit as part of evidence for one's portfolio. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So this is something that's been worked on by the uh, those uh, groups already mentioned and should be released this year. We're hoping for sometime in spring, summer this year. Um, and it's just one form of evidence to apply to a portfolio, which will fit in that, that broader evidence base to prove competency. And there is enormous alignment between the medical MSK community and the physiotherapy community, as well as the broader AHPs out there. And, and really that's the take home that I, I want to add here is that we are developing the pathways to practice for GPs with an extended role, very much mirroring the work that's been happening in the physiotherapy world. And what this does is create a unique and incredibly valuable opportunity for us to work together. So I work in a pain clinic in an interdisciplinary team setting, and that's a true interdisciplinary team setting. You know, I will see the same patients as my colleagues will. Um, we learn together, we work together, we're training together. And, and that's really where I see the future going and something I really want to see uh, evolve. Um, if we could perhaps go to the final slide, please. So, so in summary, what we're seeing is in an emerging career pathway better defined with a standardized curriculum, a governance framework that sits around that. And really the key next steps are gonna be how we can work together with specialities and how we can bring in the variety of health education institutions to better support us as clinicians to create that portfolio and evolve the mentoring and peer support structures, um, which will need to sit around that. So really thrilling time. I'm really looking forward to more collaboration um, and I feel very positive about the future. Brilliant, thank you very much Charles, that's a really fun to, a great talk and it's really positive and, and great to know that um, the developments that are going on in the medical world there as well, that's really really good. So um, I have a question for you, is there any potential for GPs with extended roles and advanced practitioners and FCPs to be able to train together? Yeah, oh, I'm delighted you've asked me that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's going to be a big part is as we're growing this community of interested groups and individuals, um, we're seeing more and more crossover. So I've been working with the MS, uh, sorry, MACP to deliver some courses and we're looking at how physiotherapy organisations might be able to support courses for, for GPs and so on. So, yeah, there's, there's enormous opportunity and I think one of the key next steps is to identify those educational needs across the specialities you know, identify the, the training skill mix that is out there to meet those needs. Um, and as you look at the work that Ash and, and, and the rest of the team are doing at Connect about an example of how that could be put into a really meaningful structure. Um, so yeah, I think the opportunities are endless and I'm, I'm very much, that's part of the conversation for this, the rest of this year. That's great to hear, thank you very much. Now we're just going to move on now to um, Kay Hurst. He's a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Health, Psychology and Social Care at Manchester Metropolitan University. So we're going to listen to how the, um, the route to advanced practice and the role of and, and what the role of HEIs play in that. So we're going to look at it from a different perspective now. Thank you, Kay. Over to you. OK, thank you very much, Amanda. You can go on to my next slide, please, Jen. Thank you. So my name's Kay Hurst. I'm an MSK physio, but I'm also a physiotherapy lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. And yes, I'm taking a different slant on this. I want you to think about what you can do yourselves now 
working towards an advanced practice role and how can I make sure that these experiences are at level seven? So you might, before we can answer that, I think we need to talk about what level seven actually means. So next slide, please. So if we use the Bloom's taxonomy of learning, so in terms of your undergraduate training, you will have started at the bottom of this pyramid and worked probably up to the analyze the green section. But in terms of master's level and level seven, taking that further, M level learning is about the top part of Bloom's pyramid taxonomy of learning. So analyze, evaluation and creation. So if you can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So we, Ash talked about maybe doing a weekend course and actually learning a new skill. So that might be one example I wanted to use here. So you might use, you might learn a new skill, but then it's about that translation into actual practice at level seven. So in terms of a lower level, might be attending a course and gaining a new skill. And then a, then a middle level, maybe application of this techniques or skills into your actual clinical practice. But then the higher level would be for you to actually evaluate the worth of what you've been taught and actually judge whether this is relevant to your practice. So the appraisal and the evaluation skills that are required for the higher level of Bloom's taxonomy. So just to summarise, so going on a course is great, but it's about how we apply that and actually question that and judge that and apply that to our practice that makes it become level seven and level seven learning. Thank you. Next slide, please. OK, so just what I want to kind of focus on is what you can do now to start working. What experiences can you do um, to actually work at level seven? So a really nice one to do to start would be to start up a journal club and actually analyze and appraise a journal article and discuss that and see because on your course, for example, you may have been referred to a piece of literature, but actually looking at that piece of literature in depth and actually analyzing what they did, what they found, their strengths and weaknesses. So that's a really good idea. And you can actually keep a record of that as well. So that's good in terms of written evidence for you as well, thinking about your portfolio going forward. The second thing to do would be to start keeping written reflections. So in terms of um, we've started a journal club and we've kept our we re recorded our appraisals, but then we might p write a piece of reflection. It may be on a clinical p p patient, obviously confidentially, of course, or it might be on one of the other pillars that we talked about. It might be on the educational pillar. It might be on the leadership pillar or it might be on the re on the research pillar. So really important. So in terms of as well as these things, what you can do is actually book off some time to discuss patient cases or discuss these appraisals or discuss reflections with your mentor or supervisor. And that'll be really good. And again, that's part of you look at the roadmap in terms of what's needed for the portfolio, in terms of actually recording and keeping a record of those conversations, that's going to be really important. And right at the top of the pyramid is the creation part. So that's at the point of the pyramid right at the top. So it may be that you've kind of been involved in some kind of service design or um, involvement in some path pathways generation or some new um, approaches to treatment. So those are kind of examples of where you've actually influenced service design. And lastly on this slide, as well as all of that, it might be that you undertake some kind of level seven formal study through a HEI. So I just want to talk to you about what we offer at MMU, just to give you an example 
Um, but again, these will be offered across different HEIs, but it just helps you to understand there's things that you can do yourself. And then there's also things that you can do in collaboration with the HEI. Thank you. Next slide, please. So one of the things we we run is called is an FCP module and the title of that module is called First Contact Practitioner and Advanced MSK Practice. That's the title of the module. This can either be done as part of a master's mod, master's program or it can be done as a standalone. OK, so it, it just helps you to build on your existing MSK knowledge and focus more on the advanced clinical reasoning and kind of the skills you need to be able to work in primary care. So if it may be the content of this, if it gives you some idea, maybe um, addressing what's what's being looked for in a stage one uh, of the roadmap. Um, OK, thank you. So you can see there it all the different aspects that that would cover. So if you go on to the next slide. So you can do a standalone module or you can do a full master's qualification. One of the things, um, one of the programmes that I programme lead is the Advanced Clinical Practice Apprenticeship, which pulls together those generic core skills that an ACP would need with the specialist skills that you may need as well. So you can see there I've put some pictures of the different of the core pillars. And as well as those modules, you would then choose two 20 credit modules that would de develop your specialist skills. So that kind of we're really addressing the generic and the specialist skills. And if you go to the next slide. If you have any questions, my email address is there. Um, but that's the end of this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kay. It's been really helpful to understand how things happen at the HI end of things. Okay. So, of course, I have a question for you before we move on. Um, what steps can an individual now take independently to prepare and build evidence for the portfolio? OK, so people can certainly start by setting up a journal club, Amanda, so they can certainly kind of formalize maybe an article they're, they're reading and actually keep some evidence of that. They can also formalize those reflections that they're having that it make them more the verbal reflections make those written. So in terms of those conversations that they may be having with their mentors or supervisors, let's get those down on paper, a record when they took place, what date they took place, what the actions were in there. And then the last thing to say is maybe embark on some kind of level seven study at HEI. Brilliant. That, thank you so much, um, Kay. That's really helpful. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of other questions coming through for you at the end of this session. What we're going to do now um, is we're going to try and bring Neil in again. I, we apologise. It really is difficult with the technology today. So this is going to be a bit new, um, even for me, with all the things that have, could possibly change in all of the what lectures and everything that I've done online, is that you might see Graham, but you'll hear no, Neil's voice <laughs> um, and hopefully Neil will see the slides. So just bear with us. We'll get all the information to you from Neil, but he is doing this blind. So um, this is going to be an impressive trick, Neil. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you, Amanda. I hope you can hear me. Yes, um, we can hear you, Neil. OK, and so I, I see the first slide is up. So firstly, many thanks for the invitation. Apologies for the for the technical hitches. Um, as I say, thank you for this opportunity and this presentation. Uh, the, the number I've already heard have been fantastic. I have been able to catch them to discuss the need for education to support the implementation of the roadmap in primary care and subsequently cross MSK practice. So essentially I'm sort of summarising a little bit. I thought I was going to be setting the scene, but I think I'm probably summarising now. Um, if I could have the uh, the next slide, please. Um, looking back at uh, physiotherapy in terms of post -regi registration education standards and career developments, I think Particularly in our profession, I think for those that have been around long enough, we can say that up until recently, 
there's not really been a clear, agreed model of linking career pathways, standards and education into a coherent strategy that as a profession we can all relate to and be familiar with. Recent frameworks such as the uh, multi-professional advanced practice framework, uh, the core capabilities um, framework set standards and subsequently the roadmap was aimed to operationalize those with the aim of blending a national MSK agreed standards which at the moment on this premise is the ITOM standards and the primary care pathway of the core capabilities framework. So with the roadmap, um, what we aimed for was the support for clinicians to build experiences and knowledge against both the IFONT and the core capabilities framework at the same time, which gives them clear reference points to work towards. You can just move on to the next slide for me. What we wanted with the, the roadmap and what's really important for the professions that these are nationally agreed and recognised um, provisions of assurances of governance and practice to the public that we serve. Um, and really importantly, it potentially sets reference points for gender for change grading, which needs to be a clear development for the future. There still is a very long way to go, however. And in terms of education, there are some challenges to be addressed and some thinking about how we as a profession work towards attaining what we should be working to, which is ultimately a gold standard in career and educational provision in parallel, clearly defines roles and responsibilities against frameworks, but as we've been discussing today, underpinned by supportive blending models to help clinicians achieve them. So effectively what you'll see in the slide are those links between the first contact pathway and the advanced practice pathway in musculoskeletal care that allows clinicians to build on their experience, to build on their knowledge, whether in a traditional or non-traditional model, through both pathways, um, gaining their portfolio um, uh, sign-offs, verifications against that standard. Next slide, please. What do we need to consider for in-practice education? We already have universities setting up advanced practice and FCP accreditation, but there still is a massive gap in terms of external support for in-practice mechanisms, supporting clinicians and the supervision and mentorship of these individuals. So going forward, we need to consider the culture of building critical thinking, reflective portfolios linked to national standards that build more for less, offering breadth and depth and the ability to synthesize and develop, which become underpinning principles of part of a culture. We must have clear pathways that are in parallel to the educational standards uh, as part of a career progression, which I heard Ash touch upon earlier, that is more than just an interview and assessment of learning of a list of courses that you see in an application form. The learning must be recognized and valid, and it must be externally validated against frameworks. So rather than just being able to assess an endpoint from an HEI, we need to also be able to see any points of the learning journey as valid. And what I mean by this is the learning process should be accessible at any stage through a non-traditional portfolio route, supporting training needs analysis and career counselling. Now you'll see from the, the, the slide um, in terms of individual clinical practice, what does the individual require? The individual requires mentorship that is at the right level. And that could be enhanced, advanced or consultant. But really importantly, we need to be able to support the clinicians in how this can be accessed and delivered. Job plans must reflect the role. Whether a supervisor or supervisee, you must have the time to gain or offer both. This again, certainly in terms of the allied health professions, is a gap in practice. It would be great to work towards a national register of these individuals with advice forums and clear reference documents that are agreed across the nations, irrespective of where you work, not just locally, which in physiotherapy has been the norm. But once again, we are working towards this within musculoskeletal practice, as you've seen at, um, presented. Clinicians need to be clear on learning needs, next steps and how to achieve these. For, for far too long, we've been attending um, postgraduate education, weekend courses, 
without clear references to frameworks and how they was, this would link to an ongoing life learning portfolio. Multi-professional agreements are vital, standards that stem not only across professions, but across the disciplines of practice. This will deliver a broader, more flexible clinician. Community advanced practice is an example. I was asked to um, um, provide support for the musculoskeletal component in advanced practice in community pra um, uh, development. And effectively, we lifted some of the MSK core capabilities frameworks directly into that framework. So therefore, it's interchangeable and parallel. Next slide, please. So what, what I would call for is a, is a um, support for the individual clinician through the wider system perspective. So what does and what is the wider perspective going to do to help the individual clinician? Well, firstly, this call to arms is to suggest the transferable standardized pathways of education that make sense of practice in practice and beyond. Whether this is NHS, Health Education England or the private sector, we're all working towards the same frameworks and therefore wherever these clinicians work and whichever and wherever a patient is treated, they will know what the standard is and they will know this individual has transferable skills irrespective of where they're working. These educational um, progressions need to link to career opportunities. We must all sign up and now is the time for a recognition on a career pathway of attainment. Undergraduate and postgraduate courses need to be clearly linked in terms of mapped, mapping to long term learning. The gap between the two, the step that we all have experienced as you become registered, needs to be in a far smoother transition. The aims and goals of the undergraduate portfolio should be um, sequential into the aims and goals of the postgraduate portfolio. And essentially, through clinicians in day to day practice, they must ensure that their clinical experiences are viewed in multiple ways and not just added to in the same way. A portfolio mustn't be a record. A record is just additional pieces of information. A portfolio is a development of critical thinking that must be built upon, not just added to. Next slide, please. So what? It, in summary, is the potential. The advanced practitioner, the enhanced practitioner, the pathways to consultant practice for musculoskeletal care and beyond. As well as expert practice, it's a clinician who has a person-centered, public health-focused approach, who has effective, impa effective impactful practice that is evidence-based. They are research literate, leading change across multiple pathways. They take responsibility for the whole pathway, if required, because of their high level knowledge around systems behaviours. There are significant challenges ahead, but as you can see from today, the pathways, but most importantly, the collaboration across disciplines, but as you see here, across um, the public and private sector, with the singular aim in mind, which is improvements in patient care through the development of education, the development of supervision, and the development of individual clinical practice that is part of a bigger picture. So I'm really looking forward to further opportunities and I'm really enjoyed the, the, the trip so far, but I really think there's far more to be achieved in the future. And I'm certainly in looking forward to further collaboration as time goes on. Many thanks and thank you for listening and putting up with the slight issues with the tech. tech. Well done, Neil. That was really good and it actually worked. So you're pleased to hear that that came across really well. So um, the question that we were going to ask you um, originally, um, Ash answered um, in your absence uh, that a question had come in. So I have a question for you now, though, that will expand on what you've been, what you suggested anyway in your presentation. So the question is, how will all this good stuff become normal custom and practice for all working at MSK? And what about every validation? The current oh, that, that, that is a really good question. Um, there is a number of different factors that need to align for that to happen. I think that coming together um, of undergraduate and postgraduate programmes that are aligned is going to be really important. We are breeding undergraduates that have an understanding and appreciation of a portfolio. Um, secondly, um, 
as I mentioned, the in practice um, development of career pathways that are linked to attainment points that are therefore subsequently linked to frameworks means that this will have to be the default. To gain a career progression, you have to show competency and capability that is externally validated and nationally recognised. And therefore, once that is part of policy, um, there is no deviation from that. But lastly, we need to have a, um, alignment of all the professional groups and the professional bodies to get behind what is actually required for this to happen. And that might be that, it, that for example, I mentioned job plans. We need to have effective equivalence in um, having time at, inside our own um, normal practice for continuing professional development, whether that is actually to sign people off and verify them as a supervisor, or it's to actually gain that supervision yourself. And lastly, there needs to be a prerequisite within our training, undergraduate and postgraduate, and again, within time, to build effective supervision skills. Um, if that started with the, the FCP model, and that's a real step forward, but that needs to be across all disciplines and it needs to be part of normal development. And if you're looking at the four pillars of education, that needs to be central to being a level seven um, supervisor that you can demonstrate supervision and mentorship at that level. So there needs to be those alignments and those collaborations, but I think those would be the bricks to, to start building the house around that answer. Thank you, Neil. That was a really good, comprehensive answer to the question. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question here for Ash. Does the Connect Health curriculum include any paediatric MSK content? If it does, is it mapped across to any specific competency framework? Hello, yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, at the moment, no, um, it's not mapped against any paediatric um, curriculum or competency framework. Um, we don't see a great deal of paediatric patients um, through our work at the moment. We, do, we It's very limited where we do. Um, so there isn't anything specific in our curriculum at the moment. No, um, not, not for paediatric patients. And just as a lead on from that, it's a, a question for now. Are there any plans to develop a roadmap specifically for paediatric FCP? Is that for me? Yeah, it, yeah, it says um, for Neil. <laughs> <laughs> for me, uh, I, well, not with it's, that's not within my gift, and I'm certainly not an expert um, in paediatrics. Um, I guess that why I'd throw that back to HGE, um, uh, Amanda, and see whether that could be something. Certainly, it's a, uh, a connected roadmap, um, and I would suggest that um, that could be looked at um, as part of um, the MSK standards and uh, bolt-ons. So we could look at that as part of the wider advanced practice standards. Um, and once we have those agreed and developed um, and, and, and integrated as, as say rheumatology, uh, uh, pain management and paediatrics, perhaps we can then increase the roadmap um, links towards that, that framework. And I think to answer Neil for saying from an HE perspective, I think that's the way that it will go for MSK. I think we will be doing a specific bolt on to add to the advanced practice MSK framework so that they will have their own specific um, capabilities that are paediatric based because obviously it's a speciality. So no, I don't think there will be a specific roadmap. It will be the it will be the MSK roadmap, but you'll have a bolt on set of capabilities to, to sign off to. So we have here a question for Kay. How will all the, um, sorry, I've just, uh, my, my phone's just gone funny. Um, so bear with me a second, sorry. I'm going to, I'm just going to move on to another question for a minute because I can't actually see, I think I've un, un, unwittingly deleted something by mistake. So I have um, a question here that is, can you clarify if the roadmap is alignment with FCPs working in primary care? Multi, is it in alignment with the multi-professional framework for advancing practice of England in 2017? And is this in alignment again with the advanced practitioner role? So I think that that is another question for Neil. Sorry, Amanda, I missed that. I just went a bit. Okay, so should I say that? I'll say it again. Can you clarify that the FCPs in primary care? is in alignment with the multi-professional advanced practice framework 
And is yeah. it in al alignment with the advanced practice role? Yes. So the the background to those three frameworks is that there was a there is a piece of research that is about to be published that mapped the IFOM standards directly to the multi professional advanced practice framework. So they are in alignment. From that, the um, stage stages one and and stage three within the roadmap, those capabilities are drawn directly from the IFOM standards. Therefore, they and also it also maps to the MSK core capabilities framework. Once you if you look at the roadmap, you'll see um, each capability is cross referenced against the IFOM standards, which will be the advanced practice standards for MSK. It is also cross referenced against the MSK core capabilities framework and what you'll also see um, once you go to the back of that document you'll see where the gaps are you'll see where the fcp does not meet um, the iphone standard so allowing you to see what you will need to additionally work towards as you come through fcp into ap it's, it's fairly clearly demonstrated thank you neil so i found case question okay. when's the when is the next module being delivered? I'm due to start my FCP role in March and keen to undergo a level seven education module. OK, so we currently have a module called FCP and AMP, a 20 credit module that runs twice a year, every academic year. It runs Feb February. I, obviously, it's starting now and we've got April and the April 21 is full. However, we have just agreed that we're going to move the February 22 to autumn, September 21. So the next the next occurrence will be that's available is September 21. It's available at the moment. And can can we clarify whether the FCP module is for stage one and stage two or just stage one? The current module we've got is just, I would say it would be addressing stage one, but people would then have to be able to do a portfolio to address stage two in practice. And that's the current situation. So the current module addresses just stage one and that next runs in September this year 21. So thank you. Thank you very much Kay for that. Um, we have a, um, a question here of um, which I shall put out there to I think this is probably for Neil but Ash can join in with this as well. Whoever wants to join in with this or Kay. So it's, it's a, the, the question is do we need to do a formal FCP HEI module if we have done an MSc in the last five years? I'm going to ask Neil that part of the question. Um, firstly, it, it does depend whether your master's degree maps to the stage one. And if you, you if it is an MACP uh, master's, uh, that will map to stage one. Outside that, we would have to, uh, you'd have to do that mapping work yourself to see if that's, ha if that's the case and get that signed off. Um, for stage two, there is no um, master's degree uh, prior to any FCP modules that are mapped to stage two. So even if you have a full MSc and you've been working in, in, in community orthopedic triage or, or secondary care uh, orthopedics, um, you have a long MSK background, you still need to provide uh, your stage two sign off, which is through the workplace based assessment toolkit. Um, and it will require a primary care sign off. So it's in practice assessment of your primary care knowledge, skills and attributes um, within that setting. That's great. In fact, you answered the rest of the uh, question in the questions. That was really helpful. Thank you. So Giles. Uh, Amanda, uh, yeah. can I just add in? And I, I don't know about other HEIs, but in terms of uh, at Manchester, Metropolitan University, if we're giving credit, so RPEL, recognition for prior learning, our our RPEL agreement is in the last three years. So if they've done study before five years, it, if it, it wouldn't count. So they'd have to, like Neil said, they would have to complete a portfolio anyway in terms of how their learning has been recently applied to their FCP role. 
And thank you, Ken. That's really helpful. And if we go back to that that point about revalidation earlier, then then to have a, a current portfolio is always really good when you get pulled for audit. So that's just worth thinking about. So we have here a question for Giles. Where do you see doctors in NS, MSK and AHPs in five years in terms of mutual standards in education competency and practice? Um, yeah, good question. I, th I think there's very clearly significant areas of overlap. And, you know, when you look at the I um standards that are out there, there is, there's clear benefit to us all working off the same core standards. Um, but equally important to recognise the differences that are out there. You know, the USP for each of us in our different roles. Um, you know, I, I think interdisciplinary education and interdisciplinary working doesn't mean we're all exactly the same. Um, it's also recognising the differences and that our strengths uh, that we retain in our differences, whether it's as a gen, you know, the generalist medical training, you know, I come back to that being now probably the most valuable thing I've done uh, in terms of applying that to MSK. Um, so I think, I think we'll get better at um, celebrating the differences and the similarities. Um, I think we will likely all align. I think the, the competency frameworks for GPs in extended roles, well, the, the one that we're developing has very much been aligned to meet the same core standards. So um, I, think, I think there will be a lot more um, uh, coming together of those pathways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giles. And I think that you've really answered the, the next question amongst that, and it is about embracing those specialities. The question that, that have come up that's kind of related to that is, are there any competency maps for ED APPs available or upcoming? Do you have any advice to ensure we don't get lost in ED? So, so it's kind of related to what Giles says, but it's also related to what Neil said and what we were discussing around paediatrics. We already have this in process for ED. So you've got the advanced, the, the, the advanced practice MSK standard of practice for, for advanced practice as the central core, but we also have a specific ED bolt on to go onto that as well. So you won't get lost. So don't worry out there, you ED people. We, we have got you covered. OK, so. Another one for Neil here. How does a roadmap align if you decide to change from FCP to AP, for example? Would you need to start again on the roadmap? The, 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 the great news on that one is one of the key um, uh, aims and goals was not to, for clinicians to have to do that. I mentioned the presentation getting more for less. So effectively what you'll see is uh, the capabilities within the roadmap are mapped to both. So if you do an F, what you perceive to be an FCP competent a capability, it will be cross-referenced against the IFOM standards. So as you work your way up, you effectively are clearing a lot of the clinical pillar of your advanced practice. There are there is obviously further developments towards advanced practice that the IFOM standards are over and above the FCP requirements. But go through the roadmap and it is explained about how the capabilities map across both pathways. So to try and visualize that, um, as you work your way up through FCP, you for for argument's sake, don't don't quote me on this, you might be 30 or 40 percent up through your advanced practice um, portfolio. And you could additionally add in a university module into that, or you could continue on a portfolio route, building um, up your skills, knowledge and experience through your supervisor sign off until it's ready for submission. So the F if you're on an FCP pathway, you're effectively on an AP pathway as well. The, the option is to stop at FCP and not to go on to AP. Of course, not everybody would wish to do that or is in a, in a position to do so, but equally, you're on your way anyway. So if you do wish to take that further, that next step, you have utilised those knowledge, skills and experiences in, in both parallel pathways. Thank you, Neil. Now, just as Ash has um, gone off to get a brew, thinking he's got out of this, so I have a question for you, Ash. In the roadmap, it mentions that you have to tick the checklist to pass the first stage and the second stage. 
Could you please clarify where I can find checklists for the verification stage one and two? So, so Ash, I wondered if you could um, expand on the checklist part as well in terms of portfolio. Yeah, I was going to say the initial part of that is, is a relatively easy answer in that it's in the appendices of the roadmap, um, the checklist for what you need to do at each stage. So um, stage one, uh, as mentioned, is very much about knowledge and skills and stage two, the checklist expands into things that um, you need to do within primary care, within practice. So um, it's taken from the, the GP trainers. Um, so lots of the things are very similar to the GPs have to do in those environments. So there's things like case based discussions um, where you have to talk through with your supervisor in detail the clinical reasoning around a particular case. Um, there is clinical examination techniques, uh, assessments that you have to do. So KETs, uh, where that might be um, things like a cranial nerve exam, uh, it might be taking uh, blood pressure, for example, in a primary care environment, but you would need to require supervision and sign off of those skills additional that, that you may not do in, in normal MSK practice. Um, the, those uh, clinical examination techniques uh, in an MSK environment are more for FCPs that have come from a maybe a non-MSK background. Um, who need to go through shoulder assessment, knee assessment, for example. But as MSK practitioners, it's unlikely that you'll need to do that. So all of that information is in the roadmap and in the appendices, there is a checklist of all of those things that you have to do. Um, as part of the team who trains the supervisors, the, your supervisor, your FCP supervisor, will also be able to provide you with guidance on what is needed at, at both stages um, to ensure that when your portfolio is submitted, it's it's full of everything that it needs to be at the right level. Fantastic, Ash, that's really good. So um, I just wondered who wanted to take on the banding question. It's always my favourite question to answer that one, but I'm going to let someone else say it today. So um, the question is, and I'm putting it out there, maybe you'd like to have a go at this, Ash. What, what do you say about um, how FCP have been recruited at band five or six and even jumping on the bandwagon? Where does a true structured recruitment guideline in place um, present? Yes, yeah, so I think this potentially relates to one of the other questions where it talks about whether the roadmap becomes live essentially from, from April 2022. Um, so uh, as I'm sure you can, you can back up Amanda and Neil can maybe jump in on this as well, but um, once it's out there, you know, the CQC uh, are, are on board with this um, and it will become part of governance checks to ensure that the right people are being recruited into the right roles. Now, from a, a, a banding perspective, um, we need to be clear of the difference between banding and um, ability in terms of academic attainment or the level that someone is at. You're able to be uh, on the FCP um, list if you like once you're three years qualified if you have demonstrated your ability and you've been signed off at level seven by your supervisor and you can ensure that quality that's a level of practice not necessarily a banding so i think that's a clear distinction to make between a band and a level of practice having said that um, those governance structures will be in place once the roadmap is live um, there will be more assurances there from from all parties that those that are recruited into roles are of the correct standard and have the ability to do so. Um, I don't know whether Neil or Amanda or anyone you want you want to add anything on to that. No, I think you've covered it. So it's about capability rather than the pay that you take home at the end of the month. Yeah, absolutely. And then you get recompensed um, depending on your capability. OK, so we I'm just aware of the time and I think there's enough time now to have one sentence from each of you. Um, I want to know what is the one thing that you would recommend that we focus on to imp improve education going forward? So I'm going to go in the order of the presenters. So Ash, would you like to answer that first? Yeah, I think for me it's, it's that structure that I talked about. So having that guidance and structure, there's lots of information, lots of ways people can go with education at the moment and having that structure and the competency framework across not just FCP and AP but across all areas of development is something we need. Thank you Ash. Giles over to you. Um, I'd have to put a vote in for interdisciplinary learning, um, learning together, work together 
um, I, I think break down some of the boundaries. OK, and HGI Pearl of Wisdom, please. OK, well, I would start gathering information a bit like a treasure hunt, Amanda. So they need to start gathering information. So it might be journal appraisals. It might be records of discussions with supervisors, records of reflections that you've actually taken place on. So start gathering it in the meantime while you're sorting out what's going to happen next. Fabulous, thank you very much. And last by no means least, Neil. Yep, thank you. I, I would um, advise anyone looking to build towards um, the, the advanced practice processes uh, to look at every clinical experience or every uh, learning um, opportunity through multiple lenses. Get used to looking at the same thing in, in different ways. Look at it from a, a research a perspective, an education perspective, and a and, and clinical practice perspective, and be able to compare and contrast um, those um, influences on that learning experience. That will then start to demonstrate a synthesis rather than a description, and that will culturally and, and sort of organically take you into level seven practice. To try to move, try to take the opportunity to move away by just building numerous records that show no depth and take maybe one experience and take it to as, its extreme with as much um, assessment of that experience as you possibly can. Thank you, Neil. And I'd just like to thank all of the presenters, which are, are, I'm sure you'll agree were absolutely fantastic today. And we have been really enlightened by their knowledge um, on this subject and has really helped to clarify some really good points here. I think, um, and before I hand back to Ali, and, and I'm sure that I'm sure that she's going to say the same thing, but please, please make sure that you fill in your feedback survey for these guys. It's really important. The, the webinars that Connect are doing are absolutely invaluable to, to the MSK community, and, and it would really, really help them if you just spend two minutes of your time just filling these in for feedback. It's, it will be really helpful moving forward. Over to you, Ali. Thanks so much. That was really um, amazing and um, really appreciate everyone's time uh, and thank you for joining the webinar. And we do hope you can join us for another one in the future. We've got um, a few on the slide there, 24th of Feb, Clinical Psychologist Recruitment Crisis in Pain and a Service Re Redesign Workshop uh, webinar on the 24th of March which was with some really high level speakers. But this, today's speakers have been fantastic despite the some of the issues we've had and um, we've got on brilliantly and I really appreciate everyone's time and effort. We will be following up with a Q&A document and as Amanda says, please fill in the feedback survey and we hope to see you on a future webinar. Thank you. <laughs>